All right. I'm live on Facebook and I'm live on Instagram. I tell y'all every week I got to come on early. Because <laughs> if I don't come on early, then folks think I'm not coming. So, hope everybody had a great week. Can't believe it's been six days uh, already <laughs> since last Sunday. And here we are again, or seven days already. And, uh, or this is the seventh day, so six days already. And then we're uh, here again. But every Sunday, every opportunity that we have to hear from the Lord prophetically is an opportunity we need to take. <clears throat> because imagine the alternative. Imagine that there's no word from God. Imagine what we do if we didn't hear from the Lord, the Lord wasn't saying nothing. And there have been times in history where the word of God was scarce. If you didn't know that, that's in the scripture. <clears throat> Times in history where just wasn't no word. So I'm grateful to have a chance to hear from the Lord. I tell you what. So we're going to get started at 2.30, right on time. I know everybody's... Um, I know everybody's trying to get back to what people consider their, their concept of normal, but that's gone away. That's all gone away. There's no more normal. We have to establish a new normal, whatever that means, uh, whatever that means to you and for you. We have to establish something that we've never seen before because nobody alive now has ever lived through this kind of thing. And 2021 has proved to be like so many other things in life, got so many uh, ups and downs. It's got positives, it's got negatives, it's got a whole bunch of stuff. So you gotta learn how to roll with your punches, okay? All right. So I got lots of things going on. I'm going to say this many times during the broadcast, but uh, I did an incredible interview with uh, Kathy Summers, formerly Kathy Summers Kelly of uh, Crusaders Ministries, who's a worship leader, which she does. She's had just such an incredible career musically and has just such a strong anointing to bring the presence of God in the room and is very spiritually discerning and sensitive. So I did an interview with her where we were talking about what are some of the things that the Lord was saying uh, to her and what were some of the things, some of the revelations she got about where the church was and where we were going. So it's a very, very powerful interview. That interview is going to drop next Sunday. Okay. August 1st. So that interview is going to drop at noon. Actually, I'll put a link in here before we uh, leave today. Uh, that link, uh, that video is going to drop at noon next Sunday. So you can see the interview I did with Mrs. Kathy Summer, Ms. Kathy Summers. And it's going to be incredible and life-changing and prophetic and so much to learn from it. Okay, here we come. 2.30, we're going to jump on in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your son, Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for the name of Jesus. Thank you that we're not supposed to be defeated. Thank you, God, that we can hear from you prophetically, oh God, that you can warn us and tell us of things to come. Thank you, oh God, for the opportunity to come before you and bless your name and receive from you, oh God. Thank you that you're still speaking to us here in America because it could be very different, oh God. So we thank you. So I ask you to, I die to myself right now, God, please forgive me for any sin. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Breathe through me, oh God. Let what is said be what you want said, that you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified, that the demons will be terrified, and that the sinners will be mortified, that they'd be so ashamed to live one more day without you. They fall down on the ground screaming, what must I do to be saved? And signs and wonders and miracles and liberty shall follow this word you give me today. And I thank you for it, oh God, and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, we're expecting you to do great things. Amen and amen. All right, where's my sister? 
Ephesus. Today's live prophetic word is, wait. Today's live prophetic word is no condemnation. What'd you say, Prophet Taylor? I said today's live prophetic word is no condemnation. Imagine if you were in a courtroom and you were up on charges and someone had brought accusations against you. Maybe some true, maybe not. But you're in the courtroom and you have to defend yourself against these charges and you got to listen to somebody lay out their case against you. Okay? And all in the back of your head, you're wondering, what exactly am I going to do? Okay? Well, I stopped by to tell you that that courtroom scenario is legitimate. That's actually what happens in the glory realm. That's part of the reason why God let us see the conversation between himself and Satan concerning Job in the first chapter of the book of Job. I know a lot of people don't understand why something like that in the Bible and why would God do something like that? That's because God is trying to give you a window as to what goes on in the glory realm, in the heavenly realm, what goes on in the invisible. Old folks used to say something like, thank you, Lord, for saving me from danger seen and unseen. Well, you need to understand that whenever there's sin, the holy wrath of God and the justice of God requires that there be a payment, that there be an answer. That's why people that think they're getting away with stuff are fooling themselves because if nothing else, you're going to reap just exactly what you sow. But too many uh, unbelievers don't understand how the system works. And we can't explain it properly to unbelievers. That's why people get confused. So in the invisible world, in the spiritual realm, before the throne of God, the enemy is like the prosecuting attorney. And he's always running up to God with accusations about you and your life, about your imperfections, about your flaws, about your bad choices, about your past, about all the things that in your life are just perfectly imperfect. <laughs> your sins, your transgressions, and your iniquities. What is sin? Sin is falling short of the bar that God has set. What is transgression? Transgression is where you know where the line is and you cross it anyway on purpose. What is iniquity? Iniquity is when you know where the line is, you cross it on purpose, and then you try to act like you didn't do anything wrong. That's iniquity. Okay? All of that has to be answered in your life. And that's why some people are struggling because they think ain't gonna be no answer. That's incorrect. They think there ain't gonna be no answer for all that. That's wrong, but there will be. So what are we supposed to do then? Because none of us <clears throat> are without sin. None of, none of us are without fault. None of us are without flaw. And let me say here on the side, this is another reason why you need to keep your mouth off other people. Because if you make it your business, trying to put somebody else on blast, you make it your business trying to expose somebody else's sins. Like you build your whole platform on talking about other people's stuff because you want to put them on blast. You want to expose them. You want to talk about how wrong they are and how bad they are, different, different kinds of stuff like that. If that's what you want to do, I highly suggest you get off that high horse right now. Because if you make it your business to keep trying to put other people's sins on blast, God going to put your sins on blast. But that's not where I'm going with this message. I just want to throw that out there for the cheap seats in case you was wondering. So uh, in the spiritual realm, when these things come up for review, the enemy is the prosecuting attorney. And he's the one that's got a list of issues, a list of complaints, a list of accusations, a list of things that he's accusing us of before the throne of God. And so what we need is a defense attorney. What we need is someone to come to our defense. The wages of sin is death. I'm going to read that scripture in a minute. But the payment for sin is shed blood. Okay? Is that in the Bible? It is. Uh, 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That is Hebrews 9 and 22. Okay. <clears throat> and apart from shedding of blood, there is no remission. To remit your sins means to wipe them off of your account. To wipe them off your account. Okay. To say that your account has been wiped clean. So God says that can't happen with sin unless something bleeds and something dies. The best news all day is that it's exactly what Jesus did. The Lord bled and the Lord died on the cross to take the payment for all of those sins in his own body. So that now when the enemy comes to accuse us, now when the enemy brings railing accusations, now when the enemy has his list of all the things that we've done wrong or our faults and our flaws, then the Lord stands up and says that we are not guilty by reason of the fact that he took the guilt and he took the payment because you don't have to pay for the same thing twice. That's the best news you heard all day. That's the best news that there is all day. Okay. So why do people get confused? They get confused because they don't understand how it plays out in real life. So we're going to read our foundational scripture. We're going to read Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's Romans 8 and 1 out of the King James Version. What does that mean? That means that God will never condemn you because the wrath of God has already burned against your sin on Christ at Calvary. That means you will never go to hell. It means that you are born again. You have eternal life. You are part of God's kingdom. And once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. That's another one that just people seem to argue about, but they don't understand that the Bible is no at no point teaching a loss of salvation. You can lose your reward. You can lose your place with God in terms of what God wanted to do in your life. You can lose that. You can lose your birthright. Just like Esau did, you can lose that. But none of those things mean that you're going to go to hell. And as I've told you before, even the scriptures that are talking about outer darkness, that's not talking about hell. When the Lord is talking about people being cast out and cast into outer darkness, that's not talking about hell. None of the words that mean hell, that represent hell, are present in those scriptures. What the Lord is talking about is being so far away from his glory. If the Lord is center stage, that people, believers that don't live under his lordship are going to be so far away from his glory is going to feel like outer darkness because they're going to be so far away from him. Because if you're not close to the Lord in this life, you're not going to be close to him in the next life. That still is not going to send you to hell. You still have eternal life and live forever, but you won't be functioning at nearly the level of glory that you could have if you had obeyed God in this life. That's where people get confused. So number one, there's no condemnation in Christ. But number two, what that means is that the Lord shed his blood to wipe those sins off your account and they will never be held against you. But what you have to do to claim that forgiveness is number three, 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have to confess. You have to go before God and you have to confess your sins transgressions and iniquity, and you have to confess anything that the Holy Ghost has convicted you of to show you is sin in your life. You have to confess. To confess does not mean just to say it out loud. To confess also means to agree with God, and this is where people get confused. In other words, to agree that God is right, that when God has put his finger on something and said that it is sin, that it is actually sin not to try and justify your sin, not to stand before a holy God and say that what I'm doing is not wrong. See? And that's where a lot of people get in trouble because nowadays people are trying to justify things that the Lord said is wrong. They're trying to justify them and say, no, they're right or they're right for me. To confess does not just mean to say it out loud. It does mean that, but it also means that you get in agreement with God that what you said or did was wrong. 
Okay? So there's no condemnation. Uh, the enemy is the one that accuses to receive the blessing of forgiveness with no condemnation. We must confess our sins before God's throne. And that's when the Lord applies the blood of Jesus. But 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in other words, the Lord does not just apply the blood to your account. The Lord also applies the blood to your person so you don't have to keep living in what you're doing before. And that raises the question that always seems to trip people up. Is that, well, if God has forgiven me and we're under grace and we're not under the law, then why can't I just live any kind of way I want to because I'm already forgiven? Because that's what a lot of Christians do nowadays, okay? So the Bible actually does answer that question. So let's look at the answer. Okay, and we're going to read that answer. The answer is in Romans 6. Now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's a lot. Because remember, this is Paul teaching deep foundational doctrines. But I am going to start at Romans 6.15, Romans 6 and 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. What does that mean in a practical sense? That means in a practical sense that just because we're saved and not under condemnation, if you keep giving yourself to addictive substances, if you keep giving yourself to alcohol, if you keep giving yourself to drugs, if you keep giving yourself over to sin, you're going to become enslaved again, especially when the unclean spirits get involved. When demons get involved, you are going to be putting yourself back into slavery. And you don't have to go back into slavery as a believer, but many believers do. And then Paul tells you very, very quickly here that those things are going to lead to death, which leads me to my next point. This is one that 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 seems to confuse religious people to their core. And here it comes. Just because the Bible says there's no condemnation in Christ, that doesn't mean there's no consequences in Christ. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. Just because the Bible says there's no condemnation in Christ, it does not mean there are no consequences in Christ. And that's where people get confused. They think that because God has given us the blood of Christ and because we have a blanket promise, eternal promise of forgiveness, that that means that, that you can just do what you want without consequence. The Bible says there's no condemnation in Christ, but the Bible never says there's no consequences. So what does that mean in a practical sense? That means if you keep sinning, you keep giving yourself to something that God has defined as sin, it's going to produce death. Is that in the scripture? Yes, it is. Um, Romans 6 and 20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. I realized I did not put my title up there. Okay, let me read that again. Romans 6 and 20. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. And here's the famous verse, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that, my brothers and sisters, is why so many Christians die early. They get saved, but they don't change their lifestyle. They get saved. Hey, this is my cousin. Hey, how's you on Instagram? They get saved, but they don't change their lifestyle. They get saved, but they keep on doing 
the things that they were doing before. They get saved, but they keep on sowing into lives of sin. And they don't understand that that is going to produce death. That is going to produce death. That's the part they don't get because even though there's no condemnation at Christ, the Bible never says that there are no consequences in Christ. And that's where people get confused. So if you keep filling your body with, with, with fat, salt, sugar, cholesterol, and preservatives, then at some point <laughs> your body's going to tell you it's had enough. If you keep not exercising and don't move your body, at some point your body's going to tell you that you've had enough, that it's had enough, okay? Now, why am I laying that foundation? Why am I laying that foundation? I'll tell you why. i tell you why. Let me get the law and order sound one more time. i tell you why I'm laying that foundation. Here's the reason why. Because what the Holy Ghost wanted to deliver to the saints today is that some of y'all looking at me right now have been struggling with guilt and shame and heaviness for far too long. Some of y'all are ashamed that you're ashamed. Some of y'all have been carrying burdens for far too long that you don't have to carry and your heart has been heavy. Don't you know that Jesus already took the payment and the punishment? Some of y'all have been obsessing over your past. Some of y'all have been obsessing over stuff that's long gone, but it's the heaviness in your heart that's been weighing you down, has been robbing you from the joy of the Lord. And the Holy Ghost wanted me to tell the saints that you need to take all that's afflicting you. You need to take all that feels heavy on you. You need to take all that's been weighing you down and put it on the cross and under the blood. And here's the thing, stop resurrecting it. <laughs> stop resurrecting it. What do I mean by that? I mean, what's the video, what's the tape that's playing in your head? Every day when you live, what's playing as you live? Is it, you know, this is my life of sin? <laughs> is it my top 10 sins? Is it my sins? You know, number one, is it the hits of my sins? Is that what plays in your head every day? Because if it is, that's what's clouding your mind and that's what's weighing your heart. But here's the thing. That's what's stopping the flow of the Holy Ghost. Good God Almighty. Because the joy and the power that you want to walk in from the Spirit of God comes when your heart and your spirit is set free from the weight of sin, when you realize that Christ took all of that on the cross when his body was broken and his blood was shed. And some of y'all looking at me right now have been holding on to stuff for far too long, condemning yourself, condemning others, carrying things. It's like chains. It's like burdens. It's like putting someone that weighs as much as you weigh on your back. Imagine taking your body and duplicating it and putting that weight on your back. And now you got to walk around and carry that. And that's why so many of y'all look at me right now have been so heavy for so long. Okay. But the Lord told me to come out here and say that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, what does that second part mean? That means that when, when we get born again, we are in the spirit. We are attached to Jesus and the Holy Ghost seals us in the spirit as the proof. Uh, one translation says that that seal is the down payment of our heavenly inheritance. That's why I keep telling you, that's why if you're born again, you will never see hell. You're not going to hell. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. You're not ever going to see hell. And the spirit of God seals you to seal that so that you know that you know that you know you know you saved. That's our position in Christ. But again, where people get confused is with your condition. Don't confuse your condition with your position. What do I mean by that? 
Uh, I use my children. I have two kids. Is there anything my kids could ever do to not be my kids? Because everything about me being their father is literally written in their DNA. There's nothing they could do to not be my children ever. So if the seed of a man has that kind of permanence, how much more the seed of God? See what I mean? That's our position. Once we get born again, we're part of the family. We're part of God's kingdom. And where we get confused is with our condition. Because some days you might not always feel saved. Some days you might not always, depending on where your mind's going on, some days you might feel a bunch of different things. But it's not based on feeling, it's based on fact. But the Lord is saying to restore the joy of your salvation, then you have to claim your forgiveness and that the Lord pay for it on the cross. But you say, Prophet Taylor, what if my enemies are bringing up my past? <clears throat> what if it's not just the devil? What if it's people whose mouths are full of the devil and they're accusing me? All right, let's go to this scripture. We're gonna look at Romans 8 and 33. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So in other words, who are they? I'm talking about your enemies now. Who are they to try to bring up something against you when God has forgiven you? Who are they to try to bring condemnation in your life when God has already forgiven you and wiped your slate clean. If God is the one that justifies, not them. And what you have to do is found in Philippians 3 and 13. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Uh, verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm not still tripping on who I used to be. <laughs> I'm not still tripping on what I used to do. I've forgotten that I have let it go. And that word there in uh, the, the word there press in the Greek means to strain. It means to push. It means to reach the way athletes reach for the finish line. Like if you've ever watched track and field, we got the Olympics on right now. If you push towards the tape, if you notice they put their nose out and they push because they're trying to hit the tape ahead of the other person. That's what that word press means in that verse. Press toward the mark for the prize of high calling. We got you know several gospel songs by that title. That's what it means to press. It means to stick your nose out and reach for the tape the same way Olympic runners do. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Who is anybody else to bring up something, to bring an accusation against you when God has forgiven you? You're supposed to forget the past because God has forgiven you and reach towards that tape. Reach towards that tape, press as hard as you can, strain with all of your might to run the race that God has set before you and live the life that God has set for you to live. So if some days you fall down, that's condition, not position. The same way if my children make a mistake, that doesn't invalidate me being their father. So if they're in the condition of a mistake kind of zone, that doesn't take away me as their dad. It's the same thing with Heavenly Father. If you have a bad day, if you have a rough day, if you have a down day, if you have a day where you're struggling, if you have a day where you sin or you transgress or you walk in iniquity, that's your condition. So the remedy is to go before God and confess and agree that what I said and did was wrong. I have sinned against you, God, and God will apply the blood to your account and the Lord will walk with you again, just as if you never sinned. He'll wipe the sin off your account and his blood will wipe the sin out of your spirit and you don't have to keep living in that stuff you were doing. That's the difference between position and condition. And that's what people get confused. But let me hasten to say, I have to give you the balance. I said it before in the broadcast, but I'm gonna say it again. That doesn't mean there won't be consequences to your choices. That's what we read in Romans 6. 
where Paul said, if you keep continuing those things, those things produce death. So you've heard me use this example before, but it works here. If you turn on a table saw and you put foolishly put your hand on that table saw and you run your hand through the table saw and you sever your hand off from your arm at the wrist. And then immediately you come to yourself and say, that was a foolish thing to do. And you look up to heaven and you ask God to forgive you. God will forgive you. But now you got less than five minutes to get to the hospital and get some surgeons so they can reattach that hand. Or you have to have enough faith to grow another hand. If you don't get that hand reattached or if you don't have enough faith to grow another hand, now you're going to have to go through the rest of your life without that hand. That's the consequence. Okay? That's the consequence. And that's where people get confused. God will love you, forgive you, walk with you just as you've never sinned, but now you miss an hand because of your foolishness. So that's why when you hear people saying or teaching that we it's okay for us to do anything because we're just forgiven, that's not true. Because there's still consequences to what we do. And when we choose sin, it still produces death. Okay? So everybody follow that? All right. So a few more things, and then it'll be time to go. It won't be a long one today, unless the Holy Ghost moves in another direction that I'm not seeing right now at the moment. The other thing that uh, that I needed to release to let people know is that when the devil comes to accuse you, stop trying to defend yourself based on who you are or what or what you've done. That is always a mistake. That is the point of the book of Job. That is the point of the book of Job, the reason that the Lord pulled back the curtain and let us see the conversation between God and Job was to demonstrate to you that you could have a moral and an ethical game so tight. You can have moral and ethical character so tight that your reputation has reached all the way up to the throne of God. Your reputation has reached all the way up to the throne of God. And God is trying to teach us some things by showing us with the most righteous, rich man, because Joseph uh, Job was the most righteous man on the face of the earth at the time. And Job was the richest man in the East. OK, and God is trying to show us something. He's trying to show us, number one, that your moral and ethical game could be so tight that it reaches up to your reputation, reaches up to the very throne of God. But number one. That's still not going, not going to stop the devil from accusing you. It's not going to stop the devil from having something bad to say about you. And lots of times, especially when we first start out, we get hurt because you're in situations where some people just don't like you and you can't figure out why they don't like you. You keep saying, but I haven't done anything. You don't have to do anything. Some people just don't like you because they don't like you. Okay. And some people are full of the devil, meaning they're going to find something bad to say. That is what God was trying to show us with that conversation. That even if your Job, even if your moral or ethical game is super tight, number one, the devil's gonna find something bad to say about you, number one. Number two, God wanted to show us with that conversation with Job that even if you have a moral and ethical game that reaches up to heaven, it's not gonna stop the devil from coming after you. Haven't you ever noticed that when we go through tragedy in life, when, when things happen in life, we say, why did this happen to me? <laughs> I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. I don't want all that different kind of stuff we say because you're trying to defend yourself based on what you do or don't do. Your morals and your ethics are not a defense against the devil. It's not going to stop the devil from coming after you. That's what God is trying to show us in those early chapters in Job, that number one, your morals and your ethics is not going to stop the devil from accusing you. Number two, your morals and your ethics are not going to stop the devil from coming after you because he will. So you have to give up this notion of fairness. There's no such thing as fairness. Fairness is a human concept. It does not exist anywhere on earth. Let me say that one more time. When people say things like that's not fair, because there is no such thing as fairness. The reason you can't get fairness out of life is because God never built it in. When people are talking about stuff ain't fair, what they really mean is fair to me. And when you're talking about fair to me, you're talking about haves and have nots. You have something that you don't want or you don't have something that you do want, okay? Well, welcome to earth. <laughs> 
everybody got to deal with stuff they don't want and everybody got to deal with deal with maybe not having everything that they wanted. You might have all the material things and have no peace. You might have all the money, but have no joy. You might have a bunch of friends. You might be totally popular, but you can't trust near one of the people because I got people in my life I can trust because they've proven in times of great stress and strain that they are trustworthy. See, you can't buy that. Okay. So when you talk about somebody fair, you just mean fair to me. And when you're talking about fair to me, this shouldn't happen to me. Who are you that that can't happen to you? That's why, <laughs> that's why so many Christians get shocked. Because you live on a planet where stuff like that happens. What is it that made you think that that could not happen to you? See, so there's no such thing as fair. So number one, your moral and ethical game is not going to stop the devil or people whose mouths are full of the devil from accusing you. Number two, your morals and ethics is not going to stop the devil from coming after you. Okay, and here come number three. And number three is one of the biggest shocks we have as believers. Number three in those first early chapters of Job is not going to stop the devil from hitting you as hard as he can. Good God Almighty. What did the devil do to Job? He hit his kids. He hit the flocks of his sheep. He hit his cattle. He hit his herds. He hit his, mo his money. He hit his real estate. He hit his property. And then Job hit his body. Excuse me. Then Satan hit Job's body. And Job broke out with boils. Now, if you've ever ha had a boil, you know that a boil is not a joke. You have to lance a boil. You can't just cut it off. And a boil is that growth, that pus, that poison that welts up on your body. Job was covered with boils from head to toe as an affliction from the devil. So number one, your morals and ethics aren't going to stop the enemy from accusing you. Number two, your morals and ethics aren't going to stop the devil from coming after you because ain't no such thing as fairness. But number three, your morals and your ethics aren't going to stop Satan from hitting you as hard as he can. And that's why so many Christians have become disillusioned with God. And that's why so many Christians have become disillusioned with life. Because we probably got fairy tale Christianity growing up, or maybe some, from some religious institution or source. You got fairy tale Christianity. You did not get Bible Christianity. It doesn't mean you're going to be defeated, but it does mean that the devil's going to hit you as hard as he possibly can. If I'm the only person you ever heard say that, I'm glad to be able to say it, but I'm also sad that it's the first time in your life you heard that. Okay, let me show you a scripture that corroborates what I'm talking about. I'm reading now out of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Let's start with verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, out of the King James Version. Peter says, now remember, Peter is somebody that walked with Jesus face to face, body to body, person to person. The, uh, Peter saw the Lord in the flesh, in the person, in person. Peter looked at Jesus, looked at his face, looked at his eyes, uh, shook his hand. You know, Peter walked with Jesus when God turned himself into a man. Peter is one of the 12 that got to experience the Lord as a person when he lived on earth as a man. That guy says this, <laughs> beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Good gravy from the Navy. Peter said, beloved, talking to the saints, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. That means the dragon going to walk right up to your life, open his mouth, and breathe fire. Let me say that one more time in case you think I stuttered. The dragon is going to walk right up to your life, open his mouth, and breathe fire. P 
Peter said, don't think that's strange. In other words, Peter said, this is a part of being a Christian, which is to try you now. What is the point of being tried by fire? Okay, this is another one that confuses a lot of believers and unbelievers too. The point of being tried by fire is the same point uh, in terms of the metallurgical process that we apply to metals. When we mine raw metal ore out of the earth, it is in uh, imperfect form. Uh, it has uh, impure elements in the metal. So we want to get down to the silver. We want to get down to the gold. We want to get down to the, the valuable parts of the metal. But when we pull it out of, out of the ground, it's got all those impurities and things mixed in with it when we pull it out. So we created a crucible. And in that crucible, the metal gets superheated. So it doesn't just get heated. It's not like sunburn. It's not like when you go outside and your car is sitting outside and you touch your hand to your car and all that. It's not that. It's superheated in that crucible. And we put the raw metal ore into the crucible. And what happens is that the metal ore melts down and then something rises to the top called dross. Dross is the impure elements in the metal, the raw metal ore. So the impure elements rise to the top from the meltdown in the crucible. So then the metallurgist can take the dross off the top, can skim the impure elements, the part of the metal that we can't use, skim that off the top. And then what you have left is the pure gold, the pure silver, the pure metal that you are going for. That is the exact process that happens to us as believers in life. That's why people that ain't never been through nothing don't know nothing. Oh yeah, I'm finna say that again. <laughs> That's why the people that ain't never been through nothing don't know nothing. Because it's as you go through fiery trials that God brings out of you the impure stuff that you need to get rid of because it wouldn't have risen to the top without the heat. And that is also how God purges you so that the gold, the silver, the precious parts of you, the pure parts of you, and everything that he put in you, every good gift that's in you from your personality to your talents, to your perspective comes from God. But we walk around with so many things that we have submerged. We walk around not being our true selves. We walk around hiding some of our gifts and talents. We walk around not understanding that your very soul is a gift. Your very personality is a gift. For example, if you are a loving person, now if you're a loving person, you're going to get hurt a lot because you're super sensitive but you are a loving person. All that love is a gift from God to share with the world. If you are super intelligent, all that intelligence is a gift from God to share with the world and on and on and on. But sometimes we get hurt early in life and then we decide, we put our mask on and then we say, I'm just not going to be myself. That is not what God wants. That is not why he made you the way that he did for you to suppress and repress and live in denial of who you are and what he put on the inside of you. So the dragon is going to walk right up to you and open his mouth and breathe fire all over your life. Peter said, that's not a strange thing. Peter said, that's going to happen. Peter said, that's part of the scenery. But what God does is God is not trying to destroy you, but rather God is trying to get those impurities to the top because when haven't you ever noticed that whenever you go through, see, because all of 2020 was about what I'm saying now. Haven't you ever noticed that when you go through some type of intense trial, you have to face things about yourself that maybe you didn't want to face? Like maybe you weren't as disciplined as you need to be. Maybe you weren't as knowledgeable about certain things that you need to be. Maybe you weren't as faithful to the Lord or to things that you've pledged faithfulness to. Maybe you weren't as faithful as you need to be. Maybe you were lazy. 
Maybe your work ethic wasn't what it needed to be, or maybe just pure and simple, you weren't living up to your potential. Maybe that you could have been functioning at a higher level. You could, be, could have been hitting on 80, 90, 95, 100% of what you could do. And you've been coasting along on 30% of what you can do. And haven't you ever noticed that when you go through something, it's during those times you have to face yourself and you have to face the stuff about yourself that you wouldn't have faced apart from the trial. How do I know that? Because you would have faced it by now. That's why God allows the dragon to walk right up to you and open his dragon mouth and breathe that fire all over your life. Peter said, that's not a strange thing. Peter said, it's a part of the process of being a Christian. Because what's going to happen when you go through the fire is that the impurities are coming to the top and the pure, raw gold and silver that God wants you to be and that you could be is going to begin to form inside of you and you'll be solid through and through and your value will go up exponentially because now you're solid. Now you're solid gold. You're solid silver. You're much more dependable. You're, you're stable. You're, you're honest. You're not trying to hide who you are. You honor your word. You, you have knowledge you can share. All kinds of good things happen once you come through the fire. It's the process that we get hung up on. And the Lord taught me a long time ago to stop focusing on the process and stop focusing on the pain and start focusing on the peaceable fruit of righteousness that is a result of the fire. Don't obsess over the process. Don't obsess over the pain because you may have process just like Jesus from the garden to his arrest, to beating and spitting and cross, the, his cross experience, his process and his pain. He's in so much pain. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father God did not forsake Jesus, but he's in so much pain. He felt forsaken. The Lord taught me don't focus on the process and don't focus on the pain. Focus on the peaceable fruit of righteousness that it produced. In other words, who are you now as a result of having gone through that? That's why people that ain't never been through nothing don't know nothing. Haven't you ever seen people that have lived what we might call a charmed life where it just looks like everything just works out for them all the time? Or maybe they got by on pretty because that's entirely possible. It's entirely possible to skate through life getting by on pretty. If you are pretty enough, you can get by on pretty or you can get by in life on money. Those are the two easiest things to get by on in life if you have them. If you have pretty and if you have money, you can skate through a lot of stuff in life. But have you noticed that people that have gotten by on pretty and people that have gotten by on money don't have any internal resources when trouble finally does hit? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when trouble hits and they and they get hit really hard and something happens that they didn't count on and something happens that they didn't see coming or sometimes just real life happens? Haven't you ever noticed that people like that just fall apart? You know why? Because they never been through nothing. So even though the devil means it toward us for evil, God works it together for our good. But Peter says it's a part of the game. That means it ain't going nowhere. That means that we all go through it. Let me read verse 13. First Peter 4, verse 13. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. That's the process I was just talking about. That that when 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 we allow the Holy Ghost to do his work and he forms the image of Christ in us, that's what Father God is trying to get to. When he made us in his image, we looked like him. Then Adam sinned and lost that image, lost that connection. So Father God sent Jesus to restore the image. And so now the process of walking through life is restoring that image to make you be like Christ in every area. So if we go through the stuff that the Lord went through when he was a man, when his glory is revealed, we're going to walk in that glory as well. But if you don't go through anything, then that is not going to apply to you. Okay. So this is what I wanted to be sure, wanted to be sure I released to help you understand 
that this is a part of the process. This is the part of being in the ring. This is a part of staying in the game and you can't avoid it. But the good news is, is that the dragon does not breathe fire on you forever. Job didn't stay sick forever. Okay. King David wasn't running from Absalom forever. Okay. The Hebrew children didn't wander in the wilderness forever. Okay. Jesus didn't stay on that cross forever. Okay. So the best news all day on a Sunday where we're talking about no condemnation is that you are going to come through. That's for somebody looking at me right now. You were gonna make it through the flame. Some of y'all looking at me right now are saying, why God, why? Why I have to go through this? Why is this happening in my life? I stopped by to prophetically let you know, you are gonna make it through the trial. You're gonna make it through the flames. You're gonna make it through, even though the dragon has walked up to your life and just opened his mouth and breathed fire all around you, you're gonna make it. And when you make it, when you come out, you are going to be better than you are now. You're gonna be bolder than you are now. You're gonna be smarter than you are now. You're gonna be stronger than you are now. You're gonna be even more stable because if you're already stable, you can get more stable. You're gonna be more stable than you are now. The dragon means it to accuse and destroy. God is going to use it to burn off the impure elements and bring up the precious gold and silver that's in you. And when you come out of this fire, see, that's what 2020 was about. That's what a lot of people didn't understand. A lot of people didn't understand that 2020 was God literally shutting down the whole world to give us uninterrupted time so we could spend time with him, so we could get right with him. So we could decide, do you want a relationship with God or not? Because when you can't even go to church and you can't even go outside, what else do you have to do? but sit in your house. God gave us 18 months to decide, do we want to walk with him or not? You see that? And a lot of people missed that. You know how I know they missed it? Because they're still trying to build up stuff that God tore down. God took his mighty hand and tore all that stuff down. And now they're trying to build up stuff that God got rid of. Mm. Okay. So the best part about there being no condemnation is that your sins have already been paid for that the blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus have already been offered up as payment in full. Haven't you ever been in a situation where somebody paid the bill? Don't you love when that bill said paid in full? <laughs> Don't you love it if you know you had a big bill coming? And somebody step in and say, I got this. And that bill says paid in full. So your bill has been paid in full. So the Holy Ghost told me to say that you don't have to keep tripping on the sins and mistakes, the failures of the past. You put them on the cross and under the blood. And that's why Jesus' body was put in the ground because they were buried when Jesus died. But the balance to that part two of the message is that doesn't mean there aren't any consequences. So that doesn't mean to live carelessly because we're forgiven and under the blood. That is not what that means because there's no condemnation in Christ, but the Bible never once says that there are no consequences in Christ. Please find that for me. How can you say there's no consequences in Christ when Adam ate that fruit and sent us all to hell? Aren't we still dealing with everything, all the sin curses in the earth? We can overcome them. My point of bringing that up is, are we still dealing with them? Are we still dealing with the consequences of what he did? Okay, so point number one, we talked about no condemnation. Point number two, there are consequences, but point number three, what I just talked about, and that is the curing of your life, the curing of your soul, the, the pure metal, the, the Christ that's in you of God using the trials and the temptations and the fires of the devil. God using that to cure you of everything in you that's not Christ-like so that the character of Christ will be formed in you even through great trial, great struggle, and great pain. 
and you're going to have a testimony. The reason you, you hear me talk about my testimony all the time about going through fire is because I literally went through fire. I literally, me and my son, literally had to run down out of our apartment building as it was burning to the ground. And neither one of us have a scratch on us. You wouldn't be able to look at us and tell that we survived a house fire because the Lord was with us. That's why you hear me say it all the time. So when you come through, you're going to have a testimony. In other words, you're going to be able to tell someone else that God can deliver you. And the reason you can say it with confidence and authority is because he did it for you. Because God delivered you and you know firsthand. You don't know by the hearing of the ear. You don't know by hearsay. You don't know second or third person. You know because I've been there. And God delivered me. And that's going to be your testimony when you get through. So you are not condemned. You are forgiven. God is not mad at you. Lord, that's for somebody looking at me right now. God is not mad at you. You are forgiven. You are not condemned. The wrath of God is already burned at the cross of Christ. The Lord is not mad at you. You are forgiven. Go claim your forgiveness. Confess your sins. Claim your forgiveness because the broken body and shed blood of Christ was the payment for that sin. But don't continue to walk in those same sins because they'll produce more death in your life. And it doesn't make any sense for the Lord to go through that brutal death and you end up doing things that continue to produce death in your life. Anyway, that makes no sense. Number two and number three, that no matter what the devil may be accusing you of, no matter what the devil may be doing in your life, no matter what kind of trouble Satan might be currently putting you through, he thinks he's doing it unto your destruction. God says it's going to be a purging, a curing, a making you better, making you more like Christ when it's all said and done. You're going to come out on top. You're going to come out better. You're going to come out. You won't be the same person. I'm a living witness. When you come through the fire, when you come through the flood, when you come through great trials, but all through the blood, when you come out, you're not going to be the same person that you were. I'm not the same person I was five year, years ago. I'm not the same person I was two years ago. Not by a long shot. Because even in the midst of great trial and great fire and great flood and great tribulation, God is steadily purging all of that stuff out of you that don't need to be in you so that the gold and the silver and the precious metal of Christ can be what you walk in all the time. That's why once a week Christians got once a week faith. Don't you understand? And I'm finna close. Don't you understand? We're supposed to be, be rebuking demons. Don't you understand that demons come at different levels? And some people stay at that beginner level so they just can rebuke beginner demons. Some demons get nervous when you say Jesus' name. You say Jesus, Adam, and they, they get nervous. But some demons, according to what the Lord says, only come out by prayer and fasting. So when you are dealing with a higher level of an unclean spirit, you can have to bring your spiritual warfare game up to a higher level. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to fast. You're going to have to keep speaking the word. You're going to have to get the sword of the Lord, which is the word of God in your mouth. And you have to keep hitting it. Because some demons, you don't have to hit them but one time and they flee. Some demons, you got to keep hitting that word. You got to keep saying the word. You got to say it every day. And that's where some believers get confused. And so you've heard me say this many times. I'm going to say this and I'm going to be through. Look at my hands. On a scale of one to 10, if you are living your life on a level three worth of faith, at some point, the devil going to hit you at like a level five. At some point, the devil going to hit you two to three points higher than the faith you have now. And you are either going to bring your faith up to the challenge and beat the devil back out of your life, or you're going to lose. You're going to lose the battle. You're going to lose the war. And you might just die early. That's why some Christians die early. Some Christians die early because they didn't take the time that God gave them to build their faith. They thought that getting comfortable at a level three was all they needed to do to be saved. Yeah, no. If you walk with God, Satan coming after you at two to three points higher 
than where you are right now. So God gives you time to build your faith. So that when the devil come calling, you got that shield of faith up, but actually the shield in the Bible is actually all around you. It's like a force field kind of shield. You, you can get that shield up. You got that armor on. You know how to stand. Remember the Bible says, after having done all, to stand. And that's how some people get the victory. Some people get the victory through a long fight. Some people get the victory through a tough fight. Some people get the victory through, like I told you about the Olympic athletes that strain so hard to win, they got to push their nose all the way out there to hit the tank. Sometimes that's how we get the victory. But rest assured, at some point, the enemy's coming at you higher than where you are right now. So you've got to use the time that God gives you to get your faith up from level to level and glory to glory so that no matter what challenge meets you at whatever level you're at, you got enough faith and you got your armor on and you got enough word in your mouth to meet that challenge head on and overcome. All right, that's prophetic word for the day. No condemnation. So if you came on the broadcast late, go back to the top and watch it from the beginning so you can get all the principles and all the scriptures. Okay, remember I told you that I am trying to increase my reach in 2021 because whenever God gives a prophetic word, we want as many people as possible to hear that prophetic word. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, tune in next week for my interview with prophetess Kathy Summers. Kathy Summers is the worship leader at Crusaders Church. She's a recording artist. She's uh, uh, anointed. She's a psalmist and a minstrel. She has very, very deep revelations about music and worship and church structure. And I just really enjoyed my time talking to her, but I really enjoyed the revelations that she released. That video is coming up noon next Sunday. So again, next Sunday, let me put that on the screen. 12 noon next Sunday. Tune in for my interview with Prophetess Kathy. Summers. All okay. right. So that's going to come on at noon. Now, I'm still going to be here at my regular time at 2 30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my weekly live prophetic word. So I'll be here next week. But the interview is going to release, release at noon. It's going to be here on Facebook. It's also going to be my YouTube channel. So the one thing I want you to do is watch that interview because there's so many revelations in it. It's going to bless your life. All right and share it with as many people as you can because they need to see it too. All right, amen, God bless. That's our prophetic word for this week. Thank you to all, of, all those of you that joined me live. Thank you to those of you that are watching the replay on both Facebook, Instagram Live, or my Instagram TV and uh, YouTube. Uh, this video will be up on YouTube in less than an hour. It's on Instagram Live now. It's on Facebook now, okay? All right. My sister said she's going to be here next week. Amen. Amen. God bless. All right. So that's it for this week. God bless. Remember, there's no condemnation. Remember that we need to change our ways and not continue to walk in sin. And remember that no matter what trials come our way, Satan is trying to destroy us, but God is using them to make us better, to bring out the gold. All right. Amen. God bless. And I will see you next Sunday.